Uh, good evening and welcome to the second, isn't it, of the Lent lectures. Unfortunately, um, I missed the last one. I had to watch it on Zoom, which also reminds me, of course, is that we're on Zoom tonight as well, aren't we? So uh, welcome to all of those who are on Facebook. Welcome to all of those who are joining on Facebook and here in the space. It's lovely to see you all. Um, it's a wonderful range and we're always very grateful to the folks that organize it and bring such a range of speakers with different topics. Um, tonight, we are uh, receiving as our guest um, the lovely Donna Fowler-Marchant, who is a uh, minister in this circuit, is a, a writer, um, is also um, a uh, immigrant and has arrived from, from overseas. Um, and we're very glad to have her with it. Sorry? Not a refugee. Not a refugee, <laughs> no. Yes. no. Um, so it's lovely to have Donna with us, and I will, I will hand over her to her in just a moment. I can say um, that I believe, and I, I say with wholeheartedness of a friend and a colleague, that um, I think she's an absolutely fantastic speaker, and I'm really, really glad that she's giving uh, talking tonight. Um, I'm very excited to hear what she's got to say, and, um, and, and also I know that she is a great expert in the topic that she brings. And it's that wonderful thing of being able to sit back and receive from somebody when you know, in com you know, you know, and with confidence you know, that they are somebody that really knows their field. And that really, <laughs> no, I mean, I know it sounds like I'm being, a, you know, sucking up to you, and I am a bit, but... It does. But actually, I just think, I just think, you're a wonderful person, and, uh, and I'm really glad that you're speaking tonight. I'm going to take a moment, uh, because as a, as a gathered congregation online and here, uh, some of you may not know Donna, and in the normal course of events, Jenny tells me that uh, my role would be to pray for Donna. Knowing Donna, I feel that my role is to pray for you as the... Um, <laughs> Be, be, be prepared. <laughs> I, I, this is Andrew, I was expecting. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so uh, all that enough said, we will have some questions and things at the end. Um, let's just take a moment to pray and uh, to thank God for his presence with us and for what we're about to hear and receive. Lord God, we thank you for Donna. We thank you for her expertise and her wisdom. We thank you for her international knowledge. We thank you that she is available to be here. And we are grateful for your spirit and your presence here. Support her as she speaks. Help us to hear the message and receive it. And Lord God, bless us with an inside understanding of what it is to be a follower of Christ and as part of these Lent lectures, opening ourselves up to new learning and new understanding. And we pray these things in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Donna fowler March, ah. over to you. Thank you very much. Well, anytime anybody introduces somebody as an expert, it always makes me go, ooh, especially when it's me, because I don't think of myself as being an expert. However, I have a great passion for all things Wesley. And uh, a friend, knowing that, made this beautiful little knitted Mr. Wesley for me a number of years ago. And so he frequently shows up on Facebook and Instagram and on Twitter uh, and on my blog when I was bothering to write it. And uh, so I thought you might enjoy seeing him this evening, so I have brought him along, and I'm gonna put him in my pocket so you'll see him uh, peeking out at you from time to time this evening. When I was thinking about what I might say to you this evening, uh, I thought it might be a good idea to start with this lovely picture, which I wish I could say I took of John Wesley at uh, the new room in Bristol, but someone else took it. Um, but John Wesley, a heart strangely warmed by the love of God. And I thought, right, what if I give them all a pop quiz? Because who doesn't love having a quiz? Right, okay. Just, yeah, just, just humor me here. 
So uh, what I thought we might do is we're going to use this quiz as a way of going through my slides and I'm going to tell you just a few things because honestly um, John Wesley was, was such a very complicated human being I'm not sure anyone could adequately exhaust talking about him and certainly not in the length of time we have this evening. Um, but I thought we'd start with something really basic like who was John Wesley and why should we care? So if we can go to the next slide, we're going to start looking at our, um, at our quiz, and there might be clues on that if you can, if you can read it. So the, the first thing I want to ask you is, what were the names of the parents of John and Charles Wesley and their many siblings? And I even gave you multiple choice there. So Samuel and Susanna, yeah, I figured you would all know that one, right, okay. And where were John and Charles Wesley born? How many, how many of you have ever been to Epworth? Oh man, a bunch of you, okay, right. Well, Susanna Wesley, being the mother of the Wesleys, and she was the mother of 19 children, um, at least two sets of those were twins, and of the children that she gave birth to, 10 of them survived childhood, so she had a lot of loss uh, early on of, uh, of her children. Um, Susanna was a really remarkable woman, and she not so coincidentally features on the cover of my book um, because she was such a remarkable woman. And so I thought we might want to think about what was it about her that made her remarkable? So question number three says, which of the following was she? Was she an educator? Was she a spiritual director? Was she a theologian? Or was she all of the above? All of the above. Yes, yeah, some of these are easy, y'all. Some of them are going to be a little trickier, but you're so far, to use a baseball analogy, you're batting 400. So, um, yeah, Susanna was, was the person who, if you can read, which you probably really can't, but up here on this plaque, uh, which is in the Epworth Church, the Wesley Church, it says that she prayerfully educated her children in the things of God. And I think that is just one of the most marvelous descriptions of parenting I have ever heard. And it made me think of my mother because she very prayerfully tried to educate me in the things of God. Thankfully, not with, you know, nine other siblings because I can't quite imagine what that would have been like. But uh, Samuel and Susanna, yes, indeed, were the, the, the parents of the Wesleys. They lived in Epworth where Samuel was the rector at St. Andrew's Parish Church. He was not terribly loved by his congregation. Um, if you know anything about Samuel, you can maybe kind of understand that. He was, um, a, he was a difficult man. He was very, very, very bright. He was, he was brilliant. He was very, very committed to the church and to, uh, to spreading the gospel and to helping people to live disciplined lives, some of which we later see in Methodism. But he was not an easy person to be with. He was, he was pretty demanding. His feelings would get hurt pretty easily. And then he would, you know, kind of let everybody else know about it. And he was very, very demanding of his congregation um, in ways sometimes which went really, you know, beyond the bounds of what might have been more helpful for their spiritual growth. And so there were at least two times in the, the many years, I think he was there for 39 years at the church. There were at least two times when this erupted in people setting fire to the rectory. Now, I don't know about you, Andrew, I've served some interesting appointments, but no one's tried to do that to me yet. So for that, I am, I am very grateful. Um, but yeah, so, so Samuel was, was a, an Anglican priest. As I said, he was very devout, he was very intelligent, but he thought that he ought to be somewhere better than Epworth. Because, okay, those of you who've been to Epworth, even today with modern transportation, it's kind of hard to get there. You know, you gotta wanna get there. And um, back in, in the Wesley's day, it was, even, it was even more difficult to get there. And it was, it was rather isolated, and he really thought that his literary skills qualified him for a much, much better kind of plum appointment, maybe around London or something, but he didn't have kind of the royal contacts to make that happen. And um, I won't say it made him bitter, but maybe edging towards bitter, maybe very disappointed with his life. And Susanna, being pregnant so much of her adult life, not surprisingly, was unwell quite a bit. Uh, and in spite of that, she managed to prayerfully educate her children in the things of God. She had a, a basically a little school set up with hours for study, time for a meal, 
and then more study. She divided her week up so that she had special time for each child. John's time with her was on Thursday nights. And I just think it's so endearing because we get this image of Mr. Wesley as being very kind of stern and serious. And I just think it's so tender that he wrote to her when he was a student um, at Oxford saying that he wished sometimes that he still had those Thursday evenings with her. I just think that's wonderful because, you know, I mean, it's his mama. So um, really remarkable parents, both really, really bright. If Susanna had been born in a different age, I think she would have probably been the one who would, was out there preaching in the fields and, you know, to the coal miners and whatnot. Um, but as it is, she sort of did her, her preaching right there where she was in, in the home, in the rectory. So there was a lot of influence from both parents on John and Charles and um, the, the stamp that they left on Methodism definitely can, can be discerned from looking back at, at these remarkable parents. Now, I've already hinted at number four a little bit. Um, what traumatic event in John's childhood made his mother even more determined than ever to preserve and nurture him? The fire. That, oh, the brand from the burning. Yes, it's so dramatic. And don't you immediately think of that picture, you know, that, that, that huge picture with, you know, they're making the ladder of themselves to, to get poor, poor John out there. And by the way, they didn't call him John at home. They called him Jack or Jackie, which I just think is so endearing. I mean, you, oh, Jackie Wesley, because we don't think of him that way at all. <laughs> but, you know, it's just, oh, you know, where's Jackie? And they were so concerned about, of course, as you would be about your child. Um, and he was saved, and Susanna wrote in her own journal that this made her even more uh, conscious of the need for her to, to preserve and watch over him. And she was firmly convinced that his life had been spared because God had something in particular for him to do. I would venture to say she was not wrong. Um, so that, I think that, that event, when you look at Wesley's letters and at uh, his sermons and just some of the, the different things that he has said, he would, he would come back brand from the burning image again and again and again. So it made, it made quite an impression upon him that he had in fact been saved. And I mean, think about it, I mean, if you're a little kid and something really traumatic like that happened, it would leave an imprint on you. And if it were Im impressed upon you that this was because God wanted you to do something particular with your life, you know, yeah, I think you would refer to it quite a bit. So it's, it's interesting to me in reading the things that, that Charles Wesley wrote in his hymns and in some of his letters and certainly in the things that John wrote, how much you get that fire imagery. You know, it's about hearts aflame, hearts on fire, fires being kindled. Um, it just, it just it's, it's everywhere. And when, when you start looking for it, then you really will notice it. So sometime when you're um, having trouble sleeping, get, get the hymnal out and flip through there at all the Wesley hymns and just see how many fire images you get. It's quite, it's quite interesting to see um, because obviously that inf um, influenced Charles as well. So we're still in Epworth. And I'm sort of jumping ahead just a little bit here. Uh, I'm not going strictly chronologically with this next question. Um, when Samuel died, Charles and John went to Georgia, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But as they were embarking on their itinerant sort of ministry, uh, they did come back to Epworth, and John came back, and he went to church at St. Andrew's Parish Church where you know, he'd been brought up and baptized. And the person who had taken over after his father's death would not allow him to help serve communion, did not want to allow him into the pulpit or anything like that. And so that afternoon, John preached anyway. And this question asks, where? Was it from a horse? Was it under a tree? Did he break down the door and preach from the pulpit anyway? Or from his father's grave? <laughs> Yeah, I was reading these questions to my husband uh, on, on, um, on FaceTime, and he burst out laughing when I said he broke the door down and preached from the pulpit anyway. He said, yeah, he was a little guy. I don't think he did that. <laughs> so, yeah, no, of course he did. He preached from his father's grave, and um, it, it's quite interesting to see Samuel's grave. You know, it's got a kind of a rail around it because some, some people in the past have been a little too enthusiastic about wanting to 
copy Mr. Wesley and they actually jumped up on top of it, which is not a cool thing to do. So uh, they, they do have that little rail around it to kind of remind you that, yeah, somebody's buried here, let's be a little more respectful. But you know, for, for John Wesley to do that, um, that was the only spot that he could really do that because that bit of land belonged to the Wesley family. That didn't belong to the control of, uh, of the, the priest. So he jumped up there and he proceeded to, um, to preach to anybody and everybody there in Epworth. We'll go to the next slide. And there's two kind of usual depictions of John and Charles. If you ever are confused when you see a picture about which one is which, Charles is always going to be ever so slightly rounder. Um, John apparently was described as being, when he, was, when he was quite a bit older, as a thin old man. Nobody ever described Charles that way. So if, you, if you're ever confused about that, if they look, you know, really, really, really slender, probably going to be our friend John here. Um, John was born in 1703. Charles was born in 1707. Uh, they, were, they were the two uh, boys that were living at home with all those sisters kind of mothering them because the oldest child, Samuel, was much, much older than they were, and he was off uh, in, his own, in his own home, his own field. He was also an Anglican priest, um, although he was an educator. And so John and Charles were, were very close, but they also clashed a lot. Now, how many of you have siblings? Do you get along with them all the time? Mm. Okay, so yeah, not surprising that, that John and Charles didn't necessarily get along all the time. John, when he was initially at Oxford, was, was very serious-minded. Um, it's interesting to read in his, his journals about, um, he took notes about how to enter a room and how to bow and in, how to do dance steps and all this, all of which he repudiated later as being really silly and pointless. And Charles, when he was up at Oxford, he had the audacity to be sort of dating, if that was the word you'd use, an actress. Oh, the horror. I mean, just, just dreadful. And when John told Charles that he really ought to kind of get his act together and be more serious about his, um, more, more disciplined, I would say, about his life, Charles said, would you have me be a saint all at once? To which John probably said, well, yeah, but... Yeah, so, so two really interesting characters, and it's, it's really interesting in Methodism that you hear John Wesley, John Wesley, John Wesley, at least um, I should say in the U.S., because I don't know, maybe a bit different here, but it's Charles Wesley's hymns that we sing, and when we, when we get to talking about those in a bit, um, that, that'll be a bit of an interesting thing to talk about, I think, uh, because they both made incredible, um, they both made incredible what is the word I'm looking for? Contributions. Contributions. There's the word I'm looking for to, to Methodism and in their, in their own way because they were both very gifted um, and, and in, some, in some significantly similar ways and in some significantly different ways. And so Charles, being younger than John, he was there and John was, well, they, were, they both were students at Christ Church um, in Oxford. Anybody been to Christ Church? Oh. Gorgeous, is it not? I actually took Mr. Wesley to Christ Church and they allowed me to get a picture of him lying on that, that stone that marks where he and Charles were ordained. I think they thought the American woman is nuts, but they let me do it anyway. So, you know, it was all good. It was all good. Um, but so, so John became a fellow at Lincoln College and Charles was a student at Christ Church. And Charles had started to become a bit more serious about his religious life. And he'd started meeting with some other young men that were uh, students at Oxford. And they were meeting for regular prayer. They were meeting to discuss devotional books. And they were meeting to do um, what we would consider sort of social justice things, visiting in, in prisons. And they, they were sort of really becoming... Um, well known for this and not necessarily in a good way because that was seen as really being over the top. I mean, gosh, these people are going and getting communion every week. Oh, what is up with that? So they got all these sorts of nicknames. So number six on your, on your quiz, what are some of the nicknames that were given to them and to their friends there at Oxford? Were they called the Holy Club? Were they called the Bible Moths? Were they called Methodists or all of the above? all of the above, and probably some other ones as well. 
Yeah, Methodist, this was, this was not a complimentary thing. You know, I mean, we, we sort of wear it today, I think, as a, as a badge. Yeah, I'm Methodist. Um, and particularly if you're like me and you grew up in a different tradition and you sort of came to Methodism because, um, well, because of the Wesleys, really. Uh, either, I think there's something very appealing about you know, letting people know that, yeah, you know, you're Methodist, that that does, that does matter. But that was, that was definitely not a complimentary thing to say, nor was Holy Club or Bible Moths. I think they also got called sacramentarians because they were receiving communion so often. So we have these very serious-minded young men, um, and for various reasons, John really thought that his life was going to consist of being an academic. He, he thought that he was going to be at Lincoln College, and that was going to be his ministry. Charles, at this point, Charles wasn't planning to be ordained. I don't think he knew what he wanted to do. Um, but their father died, and John was really wrestling with what he ought to do. Samuel really wanted John to come back and become the rector after him. And John really didn't want to do that. And he wrote this letter back to him, giving him this long list of reasons why he just so totally was not interested in doing that. And one of them was that he really felt that it was better for him to remain there at Oxford. And yet it's interesting because shortly after his father's death, he decides, no, I need to go to Georgia. And not only did he decide to go to Georgia, but he decided that Charles needed to go to Georgia too. So he basically grabbed Charles and got him ordained within uh, a very short amount of time. He was ordained a deacon, and I think three days later they ordained him a priest. So um, that gives you a hint right there of, of who kind of had the, the really strong personality in the family there. And actually they both did in their different ways, but John definitely had an influence on, um, on Charles. So away they go to Georgia. And number seven says, why did John and Charles Wesley go to the colony of Georgia? Was it A, they heard there was gold there? B, they were bored with life in England? C, they wanted to convert the Native Americans, or Indians as they called them? D, they went to assist Governor James Oglethorpe, or E, both C and D? Or all of the above, Andrew says, that's not an option. No, it was C and D. Charles went to be basically a secretary to Governor Oglethorpe, and John went, he wanted, he wanted to convert the natives, and that's what, that's what this picture is meant to depict. And of course, it's highly idealized and has no bearing whatsoever on what it actually would have looked like. But um, he really thought that that was what he was supposed to do, and he thought that in so doing, he would sort of convert himself. Because despite the fact that we sort of see, well, both Wesleys as being these spiritual giants, they were human beings just like us who sometimes had doubts and sometimes had a lot of difficulty in understanding the ways of God. Um, and so John was really going through a time of trying to make all that kind of make sense to himself. He was very much somebody who lived in his head because he was very, very smart, really, really intelligent. Um, he, learned, he learned to speak German basically on the ship as they traveled from England to Savannah. I mean, now granted, it was not you know a week cruise; it was a significant amount of time. But he, he learned how to speak German because there were Moravians on the ship, and he was so impressed by the way that um, that they worshipped and the, the sense of calm that they displayed in uh, rough seas. I cannot imagine what that was like. That journey must have been like. Um, so yeah, so he he learned that when he got to Georgia. He even learned a little bit of Spanish because there were some Spanish-speaking colonists there as well. Um, and of course he knew Hebrew and Greek because he was trained to be a, a priest. So um, here we have Mr. Wesley, the two Mr. Wesleys. Charles, who had always been a bit sickly, promptly became very, very ill. And he was really not in Georgia for very long because he developed pleurisy. And they, they at one point really thought he was going to die. And so it was decided that he would go home to England. And in fact, he went he wound up, I haven't really chased this down, he wound up going elsewhere in the colonies up, um, I don't know that he stopped in North Carolina, which is where I'm from, but he certainly would have gone through there and if he was in, I think, the uh, Philadelphia area for a little while. But I don't know much about that, so I won't say anything about that. 
But he, then he did go home and he was indeed still very ill. While John is still there, he's supposed to be the priest in this colony of Savannah, in this brand new place, and um, he ran into a bit of trouble. Mr. Wesley seemed to attract trouble sometimes. Uh, he angered the colonists because he was really, really strict about following all the rubrics in the Book of Common Prayer. And one of the things that particularly irritated people was that when they brought their babies to him to be baptized, he believed that they should be immersed three times in the font. And they thought that this was a very odd thing to do, and he was very insistent about it because if John Wesley thought something was right, oh, well, that was all, that was all, all there was to it. Um, so things like that irritated people, and then there were some other things like he fell in love with a young woman and he wanted to marry her, but he didn't want to marry her because he thought he was supposed to remain celibate. And she wanted to marry him, but she didn't want to marry him. And so you get this sort of, very sort of convoluted um, situation. And because he rejected her, she married someone else. She re actually went off to South Carolina and got married, which is a big joke because even now, People can run off to South Carolina and get married because you can do it just like that. There's like no waiting time. Anyway, so she ran off with this fellow, got married, came back, and um, they presented themselves for communion, and Mr. Wesley refused to give her communion because, he said, going back to those rubrics, she was supposed to have told him the week before that she wanted to receive communion, and that's absolutely true. He, he was very insistent about that with people, and he had enforced that with other people. But my husband always says, you know, he was being petty. He was jealous. And I said, well, yeah, there probably was a little bit of that. So uh, this, was not, this was not a popular thing to do by not allowing her to receive communion because her uncle was the magistrate. And he said that she had been, her character had been defamed and Mr. Wesley was this and Mr. Wesley was that. And John was arrested and things were not going terribly well. And he basically sneaked away in cover of darkness from this whole mess and wound up in South Carolina. And he was in Charleston, South Carolina for a, a short time and then he got on a ship and came back to England. And we'll talk a little bit more about, um, about that situation um, in a bit. So he comes back to England and what kind of mood do you think he was in? Yeah, you know, okay, my love life stinks, I don't have a job, I got arrested, and oh, by the way, I'm still struggling with this whole God thing. I'm still struggling with, do I truly feel uh, in my heart that I have been, I have been forgiven, that, that Christ loves me? You know, he's still kind of fighting back and forth with all of that. He retains some of these friendships with Moravians and... One of them, Peter Burler, gave him this brilliant advice because Wesley was thinking, I'm just not feeling this faith. How in the world am I going to preach it? And Burler said, preach it till you have it, and then because you have it, you will preach it. Now, that sounds real simplistic, but if you think it through, it really does make sense. And it, and it really does kind of point to some of the things that the early Methodists were really big on, which is having spiritual disciplines that you do even if you're not feeling it that those are things that you do because they help you to grow closer to God. And it's not always about whether or not you can discern that, but it's, it's about your life being formed and changed and, um, and guided into a particular direction. So um, among the other things that, that the Moravians did for Mr. Wesley, that, that, was, that was quite high on the list. He also adopted the practice of the love feast from them. And it's, it's really a neat thing to me, that, that sort of connection, because North Carolina had a fairly large number of Moravians settle there. And so in, in sort of the western part of the state, there's, um, there's a, a, a Moravian settlement that's still, uh, it's been kind of restored and you can go to Old Salem and they, you know, they're doing the old handcrafts like they did in the 18th century and all this sort of thing. Um, and, it's, and it's really quite lovely because they always do the love feast and that's something that one of the churches that I served early on in my ministry always did uh, in December, they always did a big thing and sang some of the Moravian songs, and we had, you know, the, the, the testimony and all that. It was wonderful. So there really were some very strong connections between um, Moravians and the people who, who became known as Methodists. 
And it just so happened that Mr. Wesley, on May the 24th, 1738, he had a busy day that day. He got up at, you know, like 4.30 in the morning, as he typically did, and he was praying, and he's really been kind of wrestling with this whole thing about, you know, did he feel the love of God in his heart? And it didn't help that his brother Charles, three days before, had already had an experience where he was like, I believe, I believe. So John is in this very questing kind of mode. He wakes up and he opens his Bible and he sees this passage in 1 Peter that basically said, you are not far from uh, receiving these exceeding great promises. And he thought, right, okay, this is good. I'm, I'm on my way. And he did various things during the day and he went to Evensong at St. Paul, at St. Paul's Cathedral that evening. And they sang a setting of Psalm 130, out of the depths I have cried to thee, O Lord. And he just felt that, you know, was, that was the cry of his heart at that point. It's made a great impression on him. And then what happened, and this is question number eight, what happened at Aldersgate? Because he went to a, he went to basically kind of a prayer meeting kind of thing, very unwillingly, he says in his journal. So what happened? A, nothing. B, he felt his heart strangely warmed. He suffered a fierce attack of indigestion and heartburn. Or the first Methodist society was founded. Which of those is it? It's B, absolutely. And it's so funny because it's become, um, yeah, I was going to say, we can go to the next slide. It's become sort of a cliche for Methodists to talk about, oh, your heart being strangely warmed. And, you know, John Wesley had this heartwarming experience. But it really matters that he said strangely warmed. Because this was a guy who, as I said, lived a lot in his head. You know, he knew all the right stuff. And he did believe all the right stuff. It's just, it hadn't quite made its way into here. And so I think he must have been quite, you know, maybe not alarmed, but he must have been quite startled that he felt whatever it was he felt. And it's impossible to know, you know, I, I doubt very seriously that he was, you know, falling out and fainting on the floor, but you know, he might've gotten tearful. If you've ever had a really profound spiritual experience, you know that that sometimes is one of the things that will happen. Um, or he may have felt just this, this, this real sense of, you know, the spirit abiding on him and feeling really, really warm. I've had that happen before. I don't think it's just because I'm from a really hot place in the South. I don't know, it could be. Um, but, but he felt this really definite sense that, wow, all this stuff, it's really, really for me. Wow, you know, about a quarter before nine. And he, I mean, he's very precise about this. He tells us about a quarter before nine, this happened. My heart was strangely warm. Wow. As a total aside to that, if you ever see those Staffordshire figures of Wesley that were so popular in the 18th and 19th century, there's ones where he's, he's preaching in a pulpit and they look like a clock face. I've seen dozens of those. I have never seen one that set a quarter till nine. Now, wouldn't you think of all things, wouldn't that be the marketing ploy you would go for? Aldersgate time. No, it's all other kind of just crazy times. I don't know. Anyway, I, as I said, that's an aside, but I just find that really interesting. But so, yeah, he had, he had this experience, and if you've ever been to, um, to Aldersgate, well, what was once Aldersgate Street, which is now, um, was bombed during the war, um, you've probably seen that lovely plaque, which really needs some TLC, it needs some love, it's looking a little, it's looking a little rough, but there's this lovely flame plaque there um, to symbolize what happened at Aldersgate. Okay, so as a result of Aldersgate and all these other things that were going on in his life, um, John Wesley had been very good friends, he and Charles both, with uh, George Whitfield when they were in Oxford. George Whitfield was apparently an amazing preacher who just, you know, he would say anything and people would just, oh, you know, to hear him say it. They, in fact, said that he could say the word Mesopotamia and people would melt. You might get away with that. I could never do that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so George, George Whitfield had quite this reputation for being a really, really kind of dynamic, charismatic preacher. And he had taken to 
um, hitting the road and standing out there where the people were and preaching. And he invited John Wesley to do this. He, Whitfield was planning to go to America because he was going to found an orphanage and do some other things there. And he said, I'd really like for you to kind of pick up where I've been, uh, what I've been doing in Bristol. And Wesley was like, eh, you know, I am a child of the rectory. We preach from a nice pulpit. We are nice and, you know, have all this decorum and stuff about us. We don't go out there and do that sort of thing. Um, and Whitfield said, just, just come with me and see. So he accompanied him and he saw what was happening. People were responding. People were coming and listening to the word being proclaimed who didn't feel comfortable in church because maybe they were made not to feel comfortable in church or maybe they just had never bothered to come. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons. But anyway, these people were responding. And so John Wesley saw this and he said, oh, I consider to be more vile. And I went into the streets to proclaim the word of God. And so this was a real turning point in his ministry because he truly believed that even as uncomfortable as it made him to do this, and he hated it. He really never, let, if you look in his journals, you know, 60 years on, he says, I still don't love doing this. It is a cross to me. But I believe that this is what God wants me to do in order to reach people and to let them know the grace and the love of God. And I thought, that's pretty remarkable that you did this, this thing that you really didn't enjoy doing because you saw that it was bearing fruit. And I thought, oh, that's really, really tough for us to hear as ministers because sometimes we think, oh, I don't want to do that. And sometimes it's like, yeah, that's what you need to do. Well, anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, but so Wesley, Wesley began, you know, began talking to people out in, uh, in the fields, uh, at the coal face, wherever he happened to find people. And so he submitted to be more vile. He preached in the open air in 1739 in Bristol. And they, number nine, I just actually gave you the answer, didn't I? Where and when was the first Methodist house of worship built, and what was it called? The New Room. It was in Bristol. It was built in 1739, and then they did a huge renovation to it um, in 1748. And how many of you have been to the New Room? Highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. It is... Um, it is a really amazing place because it's sort of set off from this busy, busy shopping district in Bristol and people are coming and going and there's all this. And then you sort of go into the little courtyard and it gets much, much calmer. And then you go inside there and the first time I went, I stood there and I just sort of looked around and I said to the person next to me, listen. She was like, what? I said, I swear you can almost hear them singing. It's just the most amazing little oasis of, of peace. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. And there's, um, there's the pulpit there that uh, Wesley would have preached from. Um, and so the new room became this place where Methodists could come and they could have Methodist preaching and then they would go to the local Anglican church because remember, Wesley did not wake up one morning and say, right, I'm starting a new church. He considered right up till the end himself to be a good Anglican priest. Does that mean that he didn't see that the things that he was doing were going to lead to another church? No, because he wasn't stupid. He knew it was going to, but he thought, I'll die before that happens. They'll, they'll have to deal with it. So, um, but, but this became a place for, for worship. It became a place for the itinerant preachers and Wesley himself to, to have to live when they were in Bristol. And uh, the new room also became a place where people could receive medical care. <clears throat> One of Wesley's biggest concerns was not just for people's souls, but for their bodies as well. And he looked and he saw people who were sick, who were drinking too much gin, who were, you know, dealing with all of the various kinds of horrible things that happen when you live in, in sanitary conditions. And he said, you know, I saw that these people, they needed help, they needed medicine, and they didn't have money for it. So I resolved to do something about it. And so among the things that he did was he established here at the New Room and also in, um, the, um, in Newcastle and in London, places where people could come and they could get medicine. And then he decided, well, you know, it's not always convenient for them to come to a place. Um, while I'm traveling around, while my preachers are traveling around, I'm gonna give them 
a book that has some of these root remedies in it, and then they can look at it and they can go, right, okay, this is what we're gonna try. So the book that he wrote that sold more copies than anything else he wrote was his book of medical remedies called Primitive Physic. I mean, it, it, it's funny, isn't it? I mean, you think, why in the world? Well, think about it. <clears throat> some of the training he received to be a priest was some of the same training that, that, that the medical, um, that he would have received if he'd been planning uh, to have a medical career. And so in some places, the priest would be kind of the only medical professional around. So it made sense that Wesley would want to do that from, you know, from that point of view. And as I said, because he was so concerned about people's um, physical as well as their spiritual well-being. So yeah, primitive physic. If anybody ever ask you that, if you're ever on point list or one of those game shows and they say, what did John Wesley you know, write that sold more copies than anybody else? You can tell them primitive physic. There you go. And you can share your winnings with me. Um, so there we are with the new room. Okay, let's move on to the next slide because it is also in the new room. They've got these wonderful uh, it, it, they've got this wonderful sort of museum set up there where you can just sort of immerse yourself in, in the history of Methodism and learn not just about John Wesley, but you can learn about some of the other early Method Methodists as well, including some of the women of Methodism. And that's my particular area of interest uh, is the women of early Methodism. And we had Sarah Perrin and Sarah Ryan. They were housekeepers, not at the same time, uh, at the new room, and they were preachers. And so it's phenomenal that from the very beginning, and this is question number 10, there have been women preachers in Methodism almost from the very beginning. How many of you knew that? How many of you find that shocking? It's, it's really quite interesting to me, people who think this is some new sort of thing. You know, oh my goodness, you know, women preaching what? And I'm like, y'all read the book. Um, this, has been, this has been one of those things that's been in Methodism from the beginning, and a lot of it goes back straight to Susanna um, and to her, her basically preaching, leading prayer meetings there in the, in the old rectory. But so we have people like Sarah Perrin and Sarah Ryan. Women were encouraged by Wesley because he believed that women had gifts, men had gifts, they were supposed to be using them for the glory of God. End of subject, right? So... Um, Women became housekeepers, they became leaders of the classes, they became visitors to the sick, they became exhorters, and in time, they became preachers. And Wesley sort of danced around that for a while. He was like, oh, well, you know, you can talk about what God has done in your life, and then have a little break and say, we're gonna have a prayer meeting in a few minutes, and then you can talk some more, because he didn't want to call it preaching that the women were doing. Why do you think that is? because he was a priest in the Church of England and women didn't do that. The only groups that had women doing that were the Baptists and the Quakers. And he didn't want to be, he didn't want to be associated with nonconformist churches. So it's so interesting, it's so interesting now that in England, if you say nonconformist churches, huh, aren't the Methodists right there in that, uh, in that category? But that, is, that was definitely not what he wanted. He wanted it to be, um, this, this revival movement within the Church of England. And so he tried his best to make it look like it was all, you know, kind of the same stuff. Um, but eventually he, he broke down and he said, yeah, you are preaching. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, let's go to the next slide. How many of you have been to Wesley's Chapel in London? Uh, more, okay, quite a few of you, yeah. Um, Wesley's Chapel in London the Victorians got a hold of it and made the interior very, very ornate, um, as, as you know, if you've been there. And when it was built, Mr. Wesley said that it was very simple and not fine. So he would, I, I just imagine him walking in there now going, what have y'all done to my place? It, it, I mean, it's, it's absolutely gorgeous, but I just think it must look very, very different from, from what it looked like when, uh, when Wesley had it. So I have a question for you. Is this the first place that was Wesley's headquarters for Methodism in London? No, what was? The foundry, yes, absolutely, the foundry. And so they've got a little chapel, you know, they're in Wesley's chapel that's named for the foundry, which 
literally blew up and was why they, they couldn't continue to, um, to worship there. And this, this, the foundry before it and this building became much the same as the new room as centers for um, selling Wesley's books, for treating the poor, you know, all, all of those sorts of things. It was, uh, they were, and, and of course a place for him to live right next to it. So Wesley had, you know, he had a place there, he had a place in Bristol, he had a place in Newcastle, and that's sometimes called the Methodist Triangle because he tended to kind of travel um, between the three of those as well as all the other places that he went. All right, let's get to the next slide. Okay, Charles Wesley, right. How many hymns approximately did he write? And you can see your choices are 9,000, 150, 3,000, or 50. And the answer is, yeah, exactly, exactly. The answer is up there. Um, that is a picture that I took. In 2017, I came over to the UK for sabbatical. And I spent about nine days in Manchester at the John Rylands Library, which is where the Methodist archives are. <clears throat> and I was mainly wanting to look at specific letters that Wesley had written and that had been written to him. But I also knew that they had these little manuscript books that had some of Charles Wesley's hymns in them. And so I, this was probably about the fifth or sixth day that I was there. And I had already found um, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling. And I was just, oh, it's amazing. There it is. And all these other sorts of hymns. I did not know that Christ the Lord is risen today was in this little book. And I turned the page and I saw it. And y'all, I literally put it down and I just, I just, I burst into tears. I was just like, this is the Easter hymn right here. I mean, this is, this is literally what the man wrote. I mean, it was just amazing. And I was looking at all these other people around me who were very studiously looking at whatever they were looking at. And I'm pulling out Kleenex going, <laughs> you know, try, trying to look very kind of, yeah. anyway. It was, it was quite a profound moment. Uh, I, I didn't expect, I didn't expect to see that. And it really just kind of was like, wow, here this is. How many thousands of people sing that every Easter? It ain't Easter if you don't sing that. I mean, oh, just absolutely blew me away. So Charles, um, Charles was, was known as the sweet singer of Methodism. He was known as the poet of Methodism. That's the thing that we all remember him for. So I wondered in question 13, he was a gifted musician and poet, but he never itinerated and he only preached occasionally. Is that true or false? True. No. Charles did itinerate and he preached a lot. He did indeed. And it, the reason I think that we don't hear quite so much about that part of his ministry is because there was some bad feeling between him and some of the lay preachers. Because remember I said he and John didn't always agree on things? As John started using more and more lay preachers and allowing them to do more and more things, the more Charles kind of went, Ooh, we're getting perilously close to not being part of the Church of England anymore. And he never, he was even more adamant that they were not going to leave the Church of England. And there was a, at one point that he wrote a letter to John, either he wrote a letter to John or John wrote to him saying, um, for me, it's the Church of England over the Methodists. For you, it's the Methodists over the Church of England, meaning that if a break were to happen, that John would have settled with the, with the Methodists. And yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, so, but no, especially especially before his um, before his health got really bad, and before he was um, married and, and rearing children with his wife, uh, Charles did itinerate quite a bit, and he apparently was a better preacher than John. If you read some of the the, the comments that people that people wrote. So, you know, but that's subjective, who knows? But uh, anyway, great, great, great gifts, and both of them gave those gifts very freely in service to God in many, many ways. Now, John, partly because he was really bossy, and he was very, um, well, I guess I'll say critical, because in a way, Charles was, oh, Charles could be so critical of some of the lay preachers. I mean, he would, he would sit there and take notes when they were preaching and then tell them all the things they did wrong. Can you imagine? And John, interestingly enough, was more like, okay, that maybe not, was not so great, 
but you blah, 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 blah. So it's really interesting to see how the, the dynamics were between them and, and the lay preachers. Um, but John would look at Charles's poetry and he would sometimes go, eh, eh, no, don't like that word, don't like that verse, oh, this is terrible, and just mark it all up. And I just, I love how there was um, one, of his, one of his hymns, I just don't remember which one it was, he just marked out all sorts of stuff and he wrote in the margins, Charles, this is Namby Pambacol. And Charles really must have hated that, but he didn't have a whole lot of control over it because John did it anyway. But anyway, so that's just, just a little reminder that there was, as, as wonderful as the hymns are, and they are, um, that there was a lot more to Charles as well in, in Methodism that you, that you maybe don't hear about. All right, let's go to the next slide. Here we've got one of those amazing early Methodist women preachers. Um, she was an educator, a class leader, an exhorter, a preacher, a spiritual director. She did all of those things in years and years and years before marrying a Methodist preacher. They were only married for four years before his death, but they exercised very much um, a, a partnership in ministry. And after his death, she continued to basically run that parish, which is kind of unheard of in the 18th century. Um, and Mary was... She was, the, she was one of the women who really changed John Wesley's mind about whether or not women could actually preach. And part of how she did that was she wrote him a letter. And Wesley was a very logical person. He really liked things to be presented to him in a non-emotional kind of way. So having an argument with him must have been absolutely horrendous because you'd be all, ah, and he would be like, one, that's not true. Two, you know, so she presented this to him very, very logically about the, the fruit that she was seeing from women's preaching. She pointed to scripture and about women witnessing in scripture. And, um, and John said, by golly, I think you're right. How about that? You have an extraordinary call to preach. And he linked that to what he called the lay preachers who were all men about their extraordinary call to preach as well. And he said that Methodism itself was an extraordinary act of God's grace. So why, why not admit that there were therefore going to be things that didn't look normal to other people? So, um, so he embraced, uh, th there were many, many women, whose, some of whose names we do not even have anymore, but there were many women who did serve in these ways. And uh, Mary was a mentor to many other women preachers. They lived in community. She became truly um, their, their mother in, in every way. And many of these women, uh, because of their piety, because of their devotion, because of this example that they set, became known as mothers in Israel. And this was a link to Deborah, the judge in the Old Testament, who was called a mother in Israel. And so it was very specific uh, women who were just extraordinary in their gifts for ministry who were called that. And that's why I named my book Mothers in Israel. So I um, wanted to share that with you because Mary was, she, she, she was an incredible woman. She's left us quite a bit of writings. And she, she seemed to have been someone who was kind of, um, you know, showed a lot of humility about her gifts. But at the same time, she would, she would say, if I have a word to speak from God, he will make my way. If not, the door will be shut. I am only to show the meekness of wisdom and leave all to God. And basically, you know, she would also go on to say, besides, I don't do anything that Mr. Wesley says not to do. And then everybody went, okay going to back down because, you know, again, John Wesley was a bit bossy. So we'll move on to the, the next slide. There are a zillion things we could say about Wesley's theology. Um, these would be just kind of the, 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 the kind of key things. You'll notice that the word grace shows up a, a whole lot. That is the thing about Methodism that made such an impression upon me. I grew up Baptist. Um, it was, it was not a fire and brimstone kind of church. It wasn't anything like that. Um, but I never quite felt like that was where I was supposed to be. Um, from the time that I was a little girl, I, I felt a call to ministry. And the church that I grew up in was not, was not terribly supportive of that. I mean, they didn't, they didn't freak out, but they did just kind of go, oh, that's nice, um, which is Southern for, uh, I'm not happening. And so um, when, when, when I was in college, I was a religion major, and then I, I went to divinity school, was still Baptist, and um, was actually ordained in a Baptist church. St 
still didn't feel quite right. Yes, thank you very much, Andrew. Still didn't feel quite right. And I had, uh, I had a professor who, second to my mother, has been the most profound influence on, on my life in ministry. And she just looked at me and she said, you know you're really Methodist. You just need to give in to it. And I said, no, no, no. And I would come home from, from, from my classes and I would say to my husband, I am so tired of hearing about John Wesley. Okay, let me just tell you that when I became Methodist, that got thrown back in my face by a lot of people. They were just like, oh, Donna, do you remember? And I was like, yeah, 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 I remember. But it was that emphasis on grace. It was that emphasis on God loving us, God loving every person, God caring enough about every single person and all creation to come down here and do something about it. It's not that I didn't hear that growing up, but I didn't hear it quite the same way. And so Wesley talked about prevenient grace, about the grace that comes before you even know to ask for it, the grace that comes before you even know you need it. He talked about justifying grace, being the grace when you are forgiven of your sins. And he talked about sanctifying grace, because it's not enough that you're forgiven, but God goes even further than that and can actually make you holy. Now, that is a hard thing to cling to in a world that looks like this. But I believe it. I believe it. And so often, particularly in British Methodism, you'll kind of hear the four alls as the sort of shorthand for Wesleyan theology. All need to be saved. All can be saved. All can know they are saved. That's that assurance that Wesley received at Aldersgate. And all can be saved to the uttermost, meaning, you know, being made holy or what Wesley called Christian perfection. And that is question number 15. Did John Wesley and the early Methodists believe and teach that it's possible for a person to become perfect in love in this lifetime? Yes, they did. Is this still something that Methodists say we believe? Yes, it is. And it is, I don't know about in the ordination services here, but in the United Methodist Church, when we are standing up there uh, as ordinands, among the questions that we're asked that go right back to the questions that Mr. Wesley would ask of his preachers, one of them is, do you believe that you can be made perfect in love in this lifetime? And you're supposed to say yes. And then you're asked, are you earnestly striving after it? And you're supposed to say yes. And as my professor who had such a profound influence on me said, it's not because we're so good. It's because God is so great. Because if it was dependent on us, it's not happening. That is one of the reasons that I am Methodist because this optimism of grace, this understanding that God is so much bigger and so much more loving than we can even begin to grasp. And that is, that's why I'm a Methodist. So let's go on to the, the next slide. This is um, at Wesley's Chapel, London. This is John Wesley's last letter. What was the subject of it, and who was its recipient? Ooh, did I stump you finally? Okay, he was talking about slavery, and he was writing to Wilberforce, and he believed on his deathbed it was important for him to say, don't give up, until even American slavery, and he called it something like the vilest which has ever seen the sun, has withered away because this is who Wesley was. He cared about people, including people that other people didn't even consider people. This was his final letter. All right, let's go to the next letter, which is the next slide. And I've given you another true or false. Did Wesley become embittered and angry towards the end of his life because of his increasingly poor health? And did he feel his ministry was over? What do you think? Absolutely false. This letter I saw, uh, a, I don't think it was the same day as when I saw Christ the Lord is risen today, but it was definitely during that week. This was not a letter that I was looking to look at because I didn't, I didn't, this didn't have anything to do with what I thought I wanted to write about. And I happened to see it. And when I read what it said, 
I had another one of those moments where I just had to put it down and I had to get the Kleenex out again and hope that nobody was looking at me. Wesley wrote this letter a few months before his death and he was writing to a lady named Jenny Cock, uh, Jenny Cock and what he was telling her was about how his health was failing and his vision was failing and he was saying, you know, in the last few months my, my sight almost went away from me and then he said, um, you know, but, but I can write now as well as ever. No, he couldn't. If you look, it's really difficult to read. And he said, you know, if I hold something up in a clear light, I can still read it. And then he said, I think if I could not read or write at all, I could still say something for God. Yeah. I mean, that just, it just, it just blew me away. I mean, it, it just, because it was just such a way of kind of summing up what his whole life was about. He was a very difficult person in some ways. I'm sure that, that he would be the kind of person that you would argue with and probably want to just, but he was on fire for God. And everything he did, even if he was wrong, was dedicated towards that. And so, you know, he wasn't saying that to get sympathy. He wasn't saying that to get a pat on the back. He was just quite simply saying, you know, even if all these things are taken away from me, I can still say something for God. And that's all that mattered to him. And that's really, really impressive. But yeah, that was, that was quite an emotional thing. Again, I was thinking, they're never gonna allow me back in here because they're gonna be like, there was the woman crying over our stuff. <laughs> oh, but it was, yeah, it was pretty, pretty profound. All right, let's go to the next slide. And we're gonna, we're gonna park on this one for just a moment. Um, can anybody remember what Wesley's last words were? And that's not them, by the way. <laughs> Mm. Twice. Ah, that's close. He said the best of all is God is with us. And he said that twice on his deathbed. Um, wow. Again, you know, I'm, I am imagining that when you're in the moments of the, that you know are probably the last in your life, there's a lot of things going on in your head. He tried to sing a hymn on his deathbed. Interestingly, not one of Charles's hymns. It's one of Isaac Watts's hymns. Um, I'll praise my maker while I've breath. But he said a couple of times, the best of all is God is with us. And that too is why I'm Methodist. Because that's, I mean, how can anything be any better than that? You know, I mean, that's just amazing. I have a friend who, who is uh, a Methodist minister. She's quite a number of years younger than me, not quite young enough to be my daughter, but getting there. And she had that tattooed on her arm. She, she, she got some, some copies of what Wesley's handwriting looked like, because obviously he didn't write it down because he was dying. Oh, by the way, let me write this down. Um, but she had that tattooed on her arm, and I thought, okay, I'm not messing with needles. But that's, wow. You know, the best of all is God is with us. Every time she has a bad day, she just kind of looks at that. The best of all is God is with us. The best of all is God is with us. And this is what Mr. Wesley lived, and this is the way, this is the hope in which he died. Um, where is he buried? He's buried right behind the chapel. And there's an interesting story about that because Charles told John that he himself was not going to be buried there because that was not consecrated ground. He was going to be buried at in the grounds of the parish church, or Marley Bun Church, uh, parish church. And indeed, when Charles died in 1788, that is where he was buried. What he did not know, they found out later, was that particular spot where he was buried had never been consecrated. <laughs> and I just have to think, John went, hee, 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 because John's response to him was, so how far do you have to dig before it's not holy anymore? Um, I, I think this, this land at, at City Road Chapel is just as holy as anywhere else, and that's where I'm going to be buried. So yeah, I just, I just imagine, if one can do that in heaven, I can just imagine him saying that to Charles. Um, and then you, you probably can't really read the words behind uh, what I've got up there because it's, not, the, not the, the clearest picture, but Adam Clark, who was one of Wesley's preachers, who was a, absolutely brilliant, self-taught in many ways, and just an absolute scholar, he wrote this incredibly, you know, elaborate and 
kind of floral tribute to, to Wesley that was um, put there on, on his grave. And at the very bottom of it, you know, he says, I mean, after saying all these wonderful things about how Wesley was, you know, a light and he was, he stirred up the flame of revival and all these things. He says, reader, if thou art constrained to bless the instrument, give God the glory. And that's what Wesley would have wanted because it was never about him. It was never about, gee, look at me, I'm John Wesley, I'm a rock star. It was always, give God the glory. So I thought, yeah, Adam Clark got that absolutely right. Absolutely right. And that, um, if you go there sometime and just, and just sit there, because I've got a bench there, it's just a wonderful place to just kind of sit there. It's so peaceful. And it's just a lovely spot to, to just sort of think about who we are as Methodist and sort of what, what some of the legacy is that we've inherited. Now, I've got some extra credit questions for you. And these don't appear anywhere on the slides, so you're not going to get any clues. The first one is, what was Wesley's suggested cure for baldness? And this was in primitive physic. It was it beer. No, he actually he had two suggestions. One was to get an onion and cut it in half, a raw onion, and rub it on your head. Okay, I've tried to get my husband to try this because he's quite bald and he declined. The other thing that Wesley suggested was that you get honey and rub it on your head. And Scott won't try that either. So, you know, if you know someone who's willing to give it a go, that, that would be Wesley's suggestion. Um, what, was, what was John Wesley's middle name? He didn't have one. <laughs> Great question. All right. How tall was John Wesley? He was about 5'3". Okay, I'm 5'8", and I've got shoes on. I mean, he was, you know, he was little. My daughter is 5'3", and she looked at me one day. This is when you know you've got like a nerdy preacher's kid. She goes, I'm John Wesley's size. <laughs> and I just went, what have I done? So, yeah, small guy, dynamo. Okay, 24 and 25, what was the name of the woman John Wesley fell in love with in Georgia? Because I didn't tell you that. And what is the name of my cat? And the hint is, it's the same answer. It is, it's, it's, it's Sophie Hopke, yes. Sophie Hopke was the young woman that Wesley fell in love with in Georgia. Her name is Sophie Hopke. We, we literally named her Sophie Hopke. And she is Sophie Hopke, because she'll be like, I'm gonna come sit with you, no I'm not. I really, really love you. No, I really don't. Yeah, no, totally. And, and, and again, Scott, Scott looked at me one day and he said, Mr. Wesley's going to say, girl, you got some explaining to do. Why did you name your cat that? But yeah, so I just thought you'd have a little fun with those little, with those questions. And now I think you probably may have something that you want to ask me or say or whatever. Thank you ever so much. <laughs> um, I think the way it works, it goes like this. First of all, can we say thank you for a wonderful talk? Absolutely wonderful. Can we show our appreciation? To and, and, Mr. Wesley's grateful. And, and thank you ever so much for bringing something of a, of a different style. Uh, you know, bringing something of that uh, southern that southern, uh, that, that southern sense of Wesley speaking in a very different tongue. <laughs> I thought that was, I thought that was lovely. Um, absolutely wonderful. Yes, so um, we open the floor up. Is there anyone who's got some questions that they would like to ask? Um, you know, obviously we've covered quite a lot of material. Yeah. Um, but uh, any, any questions? Any questions? Can I say, as they're thinking of their questions, I am really inspired by your, dist your story of kind of choosing to come into mm. Methodism. Um, I largely came into Methodism because I was attracted to intelligent, strong women. Mm. And they all seemed to have jobs in the Methodist church. <laughs> so, so I used to go to the Methodist church because that's where the girls <laughs> I liked were. And one of my ex-girlfriends, of course, was, was president of conference a, a few years back. Um, and so... Um, uh, so I, 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 I really was dragged into Methodism by accident. Mm. So hearing you actually say that you looked at the theology and so on, I thought that was uh, fascinating. And I, and I didn't mention, and probably should have, it was those hymns too. Ah, yes. I mean, yeah. yeah. 
Yes, I'm, I'm a Methodist minister who's not keen on preaching and doesn't like hymns. So, um, <laughs> I think we can say with some certainty that the Methodist churches embraces diversity. <laughs> and, and actually, we, we've discovered, haven't we, we, we don't always agree with the speakers, but I think tonight we had, uh, we had a, a, an inspiring evening. Oh, thank so, you. So, uh, questions from the floor, Any, anything that we, we, we might like to ask? I think you've dumbfounded them. Oh, Sarah. Oh, that's such a good question. Yeah, I've got, there, there's two, I, uh, on any given day, there's, there's one of the two that because they're so kind of neck and neck. One of them is, and can it be? I mean, you know, you can't go wrong with that. And the other one is Jesus, lover of my soul, which we sang today and I just about levitated. Yeah, both, both of those. And I think, I mean, gosh, I love so many of them. I mean, love divine, all loves excelling. There's just, there's just so many of them. Christ the Lord is risen today. But for me, I think, um, especially Jesus, lover of my soul, I just, first of all, I love just the way that he just kind of makes one, one stanza flow into the next one. I mean, it's just such a natural progression of, of thought. And this past week, the, uh, the gospel for uh, the lectionary reading was, you know, Jesus as a mother hen, you know, wanting to, to draw, draw the babies under, under her wings. And I love in that hymn where, you know, what is it he says, um, neath the shadow of your wings, you know. I just, I love that. I think that's absolutely amazing. And then the last stanza of it when it talks about the fountain springing up to eternity. Again, I just, hmm, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get weepy today. I was, you know, trying to be in, in preacher mode, but uh, yeah, no, there's there's just something incredible about that. And when you're singing with a bunch of Methodists who sing it like they mean it, because I have sung and can it be with Presbyterians who weren't singing it like they meant it, and they were dear people, and I loved them terribly, but I just went, oh, you didn't get it. <laughs> just... <laughs> And you hear all those voices. Yeah. 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 And sometimes when Andrew Pennycook on a Sunday morning is really... Yes, yes, beside, thank you. Yes, when he gets beside himself, you know, and he's doing his thing. And that, but, but yes, so I'm, I'm not completely anti him. Okay. I'm not okay. completely anti Okay. All right. There's um, hope for you. Thank you. Oh, Leslie. They're lovely people. I spent eight years with them. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. Did you hear that, Mr. Wesley? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'm never going to hear his voice in the same accent. I'm really not. <laughs> Gosh, th I am sorry, Mr. Wesley. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny. Yes, it's much. Yep. Is is it it so you can, it's so that you can sing by the piano. I was going. Sorry. Yes. Um, I would very much like to invite you to come next year and talk to us about the women in your book. Yes. <laughs> would you do that? I would be very happy to do that. Excellent. I have been, I've been asked surprisingly not. We know, given COVID, you know. I, I didn't get to, because the book came out really early on uh, when, when COVID started happening. And so I did have, um, I did have one little signing party where we had about six people there because we all had to be very socially distanced and, you know, all this sort of yeah. thing. Um, yeah, thank you, Andrew. Yeah, it's, and it is, it is available through the usual outlets, I will say. Even, even Watersons, I think, if you, if you ask them, they can carry it for you. I asked you this time to speak about Wesley because I've not heard anybody speak as enthusiastically about Wesley as the first time I heard you speak. And I feel that as Methodists in this country, we've got a lot to learn from you that, about that is, so funny. <laughs> that is so funny that you said that because someone said to me when I came over in 2019 to do all the, the interview stuff, she said, we need you because we need you to bring Wesley back to us because we, we don't have a sense of who he is. And, and I thought she was exaggerating. No. Nope. Um, 
yeah, no, I just, yeah, I, I think, I think he, I think he was incredible, and I think, I think the very fact that he had so many flaws, and that you know so much about those flaws, because if you, if you read his letters and you read things that were written about him, you, you see that, you know, he was, he was just like the rest of us. Um, that, that actually gives me a lot of hope. Please, Caroline. Um, I have read your book. <laughs> and um, so therefore it didn't come as a surprise that there were women preachers. In fact, it didn't come as a surprise anyway because I knew that. But one of the things that I hadn't realized until I read your book was how much certain branches of Methodism actually tried to cover that up almost. And I found myself getting more and more annoyed yes. that that had happened. Yes. Um, and that even when people's um, uh, obituaries were written, yes. uh, what they had done in terms of preaching was removed. And I don't know whether, I mean, the, perhaps that's some, uh, the subject for another day, but it, it, it's just something that saddens me yes. when actually we should be proud of the fact that women were able to do that from very, very early on. Yes. Absolutely. It was infuriating to me. The more I would read about that, the angrier I would get. And my husband was just like, oh, God, please let her finish this book soon because she's just about to explode over there. <laughs> Perhaps we can make that the advert for next year's talk. Ah, there talk. you go. Maybe so. Yeah. yeah it, was, it was interesting, wasn't it? Because relatively recently there was something in, uh, it might have been the Methodist Recorder or other, declaring that Methodism had officially had women preachers since 1976. And um, I got it in the year when I went to Lay Hill because they'd had preachers, women preachers, there since 1874. But of course, that's nothing next. To yes, yes, all right, yes, yes, yes exactly. <laughs> I'm not claiming it, but I'm just saying it's an interesting point. Well, uh, thank you, folks. Any, any final questions? Any more for any more? Well, thank you ever so much. Thanks for inviting um, me. We have. One thing, yes, there's a collection, I mean, obviously, with all that's going on in the world, um, all we can, uh, very important, doing a lot of work on the ground. Uh, we're doing, a, we, there is a, uh, a collection, we're taking a collection for all we can. Uh, practical action, inspired by Wesley, it seems like a very good way to end that. Um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much Thanks. for coming. Thank you. And uh, I think, yeah, <laughs> brilliant stuff. Take a bow. Do you like Mr. Wesley and take a bow? <laughs>